this session. And this is fantastic. It's wonderful to see so many young people, new people. Um, just a title alone got me running over here. Uh, female entrepreneurs flourish in LA stories of success in e-commerce. I mean, how much better can that sound? Um, and obviously, we're all going to be part of a very informative and educational um, uh, panel, uh, panel of UCL alumni. Um, this event, by the way, is I think our third for this year where Women in Philanthropy joins forces with other uh, d divisions, departments. So this time it's Women in Philanthropy, it's Startup UCLA, the Alumni Association, UCLA Anderson's Alumni Program. So information, if you're interested about any of us, information is uh, outside by the door. A few words about women in philanthropy. Um, God, it's a fantastic group of women that I just love going to every event and, and, and happy, to, ha happy to be in lead. Um, to date, the women have raised $350 million for UCLA, not counting Marian Anderson's last hundred million. So that's the unofficial number, but the, the, unofficial, the official number is uh, 350. The unofficial is, is more than $450 million. Um, the group was started by a handful of women in 1994 uh, for all the right reasons uh, to, to pioneer um, our presence on campus and to make a difference. Um, there is one of the, the handful of ladies, and that's Joy Monkarsh. Joy, can you stand up? Or just <laughs> If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be. That simple. Um, um, I'm, I'm touched by you. <laughs> I'm being emotional because of you. Um, because of what these original 20 women did, uh, today the campus is filled with um, um, our, our presence uh, from the UCLA Foundation to all major uh, portions of the campus. And one of the goals of uh, women in philanthropy is also to include um, all corners of the campus in our uh, uh, programs. Um, my, it is going to be my pleasure now to introduce Dean, Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Programs, Patricia Turner. Um, Dr. Turner was appointed to her position to UCLA in 2012. She comes to us from UC, Irv <coughs> UC Davis, where she held uh, a, the very, a very similar position. Um, but what struck me about her bio is that she's also a professor uh, in world arts and cultures and African studies. Uh, and her research focuses on racial dynamics as they, as they, uh, as they surface in folklore and popular culture. So with that, I welcome Dean Turner. Thank you, Aggie, for that lovely introduction. It's so nice to be with you this evening. Um, as she said, I serve UCLA as Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education. Please raise your hand if you know what I do. <laughs> I think a lot of people hear my title and they go, oh, that's very good. That's fair. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. What is that? Uh, <laughs> I'm the senior officer on campus charged with anything to do with the academic side of an undergraduate's experience. So think anything to do with the majors, the minors, general education. The transcript is my document of choice. Um, I work with the Academic Senate on approvals for 
for courses, for minors, uh, the units that advise our students, the honors program, the um, academic advancement program, anything that enhances the student's academic experience here. That's what the chancellor, Jean Block, and the uh, provost executive vice chancellor have appointed me to be in charge of. I also work with fundraising for the programs we have for students as well as for scholarship support and it's through those responsibilities that I got to know some of the individuals involved with women in philanthropy and came to respect so much what this organization has contributed to UCLA in its history. Not just the really impressive dollar figures that we just heard, which are not to be messed with, but also in terms of the time and resources that this organization has given to campus. Just one example, um, we have a course that my predecessor, Judy Smith, designed on philanthropy and the Women in Philanthropy group, in addition to providing financial support for it, if you don't know about the course, it's a, it's a 10 week course, regular, a, regular, a regular course in our civic engagement minor. And uh, we have a grant from the Once Upon a Time Foundation that allows the students to give away $50,000. Once Upon a Time Foundation gives us $50,000 and students spend the quarter identifying a not-for-profit in the Southern California region that could benefit from getting, and getting, getting resources. And the class is divided into teams, and the teams do, they, they hone their research skills, finding out about the possible recipients of these funds. They refine their um, financial skills by looking at their fi the financial statements. They interview principals, and they come down at the end, and they work as a board, and they distribute these resources. Women in philanthropy supported that course this year financially, but also in giving guest lectures in the course around how they conduct their decision making around philanthropy and, and contributions. So very, very soon after I arrived here two years ago, I was aware of what women in philanthropy has, has to offer to campus, and I'm just so impressed by that. In my role as Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education, I have the opportunity to think about where we want to invest our, our sometimes rather limited um, human and financial resources. So I've been able in the past couple of years, working with others always, of course, to really transform entrepreneurship education on campus. Um, the, the Startup UCLA Summer Accelerator Program that you're gonna be hearing about a little bit more, we moved that to the Division of Undergraduate Education in the past two years, so that a program that had been primarily available to the social sciences is available more broadly to students. We worked really hard with our colleagues in Anderson to get an entrepreneurship minor approved. As I said before, majors and minors, that's my, my bailiwick. Um, and um, um, we're um, able to secure funding from the Blackstone Foundation uh, for the Blackstone Launchpad at UCLA, which is elsewhere in, in this building. These entrepreneurship resources provide every enterprising UCLA student with foundational skills to start and possibly fail at a venture in a relatively risk-free environment. They learning, learning about failure comes with the territory. Um, investing in UCLA entrepreneurship, we feel, will fuel the growing entrepreneurial spirit among our ambitious students and help them bring game-changing ideas to Calif uh, the California marketplace. Um, there is, um, when, I, when I think about my job as Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education, I often, often say, if you want to understand what I do, I'm the Dean of Graduation. I am the person who wants to make sure that every one of our six or 7,000 students who graduate each year walks away from this institution with a viable academic foundation, a major 
general education, in some cases a double major and, and a minor, but also a partner experience that prepares them for the, the workplace and for citizenship after they leave UCLA. Everyone leaving here, graduating with what they need is, is, is my responsibility and I've thoroughly enjoyed working with the entrepreneurship efforts on campus. I was saying in the time before we got started today that in thinking about what I would remark upon tonight at this venture and the, I, I love that we're focusing on, on, on e-commerce, but women entrepreneurs are about so much more than e-commerce. Those of you who are engaged in e-commerce are standing on the shoulders of women um, who were entrepreneurs in much more, more challenging circumstances. And I leave as my example my bracelet, um, which I, I acquired this past summer in the Langa Township in Cape Town, South Africa where I was able to have dinner at the home of a woman who's known as, as Mama Sheila. Mama Sheila was a victim of spousal abuse in the pre, in, during the apartheid era while Nelson Mandela was still in prison. She got herself out of a bad circumstance and um, she, she, she looked for ways to support herself and her family with a very entrepreneurial spirit. When, when, um, Apartheid fell, she noticed that people were coming from all over the world in these huge shiny buses. And they would drive through the townships and they would take pictures from their windows, but they wouldn't get out in the township. They would just drive through bus after bus. When she tells the story, she said, you know, I knew I had to rescue those people. I needed to get them out of their cages. So she bought several township homes in a row and she's built a, a restaurant and a music complex there so that the bus tours can go to Langa and you get out and you walk through the township and you have um, um, South African foods there, you hear South African music and you're out of the buses. And what it took for this woman is everything about entrepreneurship. To, to manage that, and, and in, the, in the alcove of the, of the restaurant, there are um, South African artifacts that you can, you, can, you can purchase there as well. You'll appreciate this, Anne. So, uh, so uh, that's where I got this bracelet and many other things, and it symbolizes the way in which I think women entrepreneurs today um, and in this place are a part of a network nationwide, uh, 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 worldwide, that, that makes all of us, all of you, stronger. So with that, I'd like to introduce Deanna Evans. Thank you, Dean Turner. Um, I'm Deanna Evans. I'm the Executive Director of Entrepreneurial Programs for Startup UCLA. And that's a rather long title, and you might you know, think, what do I do as well? Um, I basically oversee the Startup UCLA Summer Accelerator as well as the Blackstone Launchpad programs. Um, in um, 2012, Startup UCLA was founded. Um, we invited the first group of students and alumni startup teams to participate in the Summer Accelerator, which was an intense 10-week program to develop their tech-based startups. This July, we will be starting our fourth Startup UCLA Summer Accelerator. And I met with Robert Jadon today, who is the director of the Summer Accelerator, and this year is going to be one of the best. We're really looking at different ways of um, tweaking it, and each year, you know, he wants to push it a little bit further to make it better from the last year. And then in 2014, um, the Blackstone Launchpad at UCLA was added under the Startup UCLA program. Last year, about this time, I was actually beginning training at University of Miami on how to um, better understand how to create the Blackstone Launchpad at UCLA. Um, we were very fortunate to get a three-year grant, which included uh, UCLA, UCI, as well as USC. And we all have launch pads, and we all work and collaborate together along with the Los Angeles Economic Development Corp. So it's been a great opportunity um, this past year 
to learn how to build this program. And last, last year, last summer, we were busy with the renovations of our space. And then we, um, we launched in November of 2014. And since November, we have had 121 ventures, that student and alumni ventures, come in seeking our services um, for venture consulting. So these are ventures at any stage of development, any vertical space, that are coming into um, the Blackstone Launchpad and learning about you know, what they need to do for their next stage of development. And when we don't know, you know how to help them, um, because there are some areas that we may be um, not as knowledgeable, then we always have different campus programs like OIP that we can refer to, or we have um, our sponsor, legal sponsor, that we can refer to as well. So we are really building this community that where we can help um, students and alumni develop and launch their ideas. And there's more that's going on on campus um, besides what Startup UCLA is doing. In fact, um, two years ago, there was an entrepreneurship council that was created by a Tech Bruins graduate student. And this was after there was a number of events that had occurred and we were all sort of like, you know, bumping into each other with our events, you know, having same events the same week or same people. And it was like, okay, we all need to talk and like write up our calendar because we really need to maximize the value for students and rather than keep on duplicating these efforts. So right now the Entrepreneurship Council has about 14 different um, resources on campus as well as student groups that work together on collaborations and you'll find out in um, October we'll have an Innovation Week. It'll be our third Innovation Week where we have events um, celebrating entrepreneurship. And then in, in addition to that, um, out, of, out of that Entrepreneurship Council, there is the BruinCubate.com website, which I recommend you write down. It's BruinCubate.com website, and it's a great resource for you to know what's going on on campus with all the different groups as for their events on entrepreneurship. And then many UCLA student groups um, continue to expand their entrepreneurial vision, such as with Bruin Entrepreneurs uh, developing a student incubator and collaborating with Sigma Eta Pi on LA Hacks, which is the largest West Coast hackathon with 1,300 hackers in Poly Pavilion um, during one weekend this last April. The increased awareness and growth in the entrepreneurship community at UCLA is because of a lot of different groups, people, it's driven by students, alumni, UCLA supporters. And in the past three years, I have seen it grow, and it's really exciting to see it become very real and breathing. And, and it's all a part from what you have done and your contributions as well. So I thank you for sharing your entrepreneurial spirit and supporting all that we are doing at UCLA for Entrepreneurs. Thank you. Now I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening. Um, Jesse Draper graduated from UCLA in 2006 with a bachelor's degree in acting from the School of Theater, Film, and Television. After graduating, she created the television program, The Valley Girl Show, in which she interviews leading business and technology entrepreneurs in 10 to 20 minute segments. And she also started an investment fund for female entrepreneurs called Valley Girl Ventures. Uh, Jesse's show is syndicated um, with Fox and, or, CBS, sorry. <laughs> and um, she just shared with us this evening that she has been nominated um, or being considered for, she has been nominated for an Emmy. So, so let's um, give a warm Bruin welcome to Jesse's. Hi, guys. Um, I uh, thank you so much for the kind welcome, and also thank you, um, you know, women in philanthropy at UCLA. You guys do so much. 
I really appreciate you having me here today. Um, this nice man gave me a lecture on my mic and I already like broke it, which is gonna be exciting. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, welcome to our panel today. We have an incredible panel and it's just a great day. Like in general, it's just a great day because not only do we have a great panel, but there are three, uh, there are four incredible female entrepreneurs in the e-commerce space, and they're four of my favorite e-commerce entrepreneurs who are going to shed a little light on the e-commerce industry for you, because I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but there is a woman on Etsy making over a million dollars a year. One woman making over a million dollars a year on her Etsy shop. There is just so much crazy stuff going on in e-commerce. 50% of all e-commerce traffic in the US is taking place on our phones now. Um, and Amazon Prime is robbing me blind. I don't know about you guys, but it's like one click is just, it's too much. It's too easy. It's just taking all of my money. So I'm going to jump right in and introduce our incredible panel for today um, to shed a little light on this world that's stealing all of my money. Um, so first up, we have Ashley Merrill, the CEO and co-founder of Lunia, and she's also an angel investor. Come on up. Why don't you guys start that way? Okay, come on up. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, we also have Kelsey Dury, the CEO and founder of Vow to be Chic. Come on up here. Ann Wang, the co-founder of Onru. Yay! I want a louder round of applause for these ladies. They're killing it. Okay, up next we have Anais, and I apologize ahead of time. Anais Tadlui, Tad Tadlui, the founder of Ezki. So please welcome Anais. Okay, okay, let's hope I figure this microphone situation out. Um, Okay, well, so, you know, we have these incredible women here, and the thing that's brought us all together is we're all Bruins. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this mic out. Hello? Can you hear me now? No? Oh, there we go. Yay! I'm in tech. I should be able to turn on a microphone. Um, so, you know, the thing that brought us all here is that we're all Bruins, and all of you are Bruins as well. Is that correct? Is everyone a Bruin here? Woohoo! Should we do an eight clap? I think we should. We should do an eight clap. Yes, 100%. Okay, are you ready? You see LA! You see LA! Fight, fight, fight! I had to wake you all up. Okay, woohoo! So, um, you know, I'd love to start, um, ladies, with, you know, you obviously all went to this incredible school, and it's all brought us all here together. What is one experience you have, you had, you know, at UCLA that you feel like has affected your career in some way? <laughs> Anne, do you want to start? Sure. Um, can you guys, am I taking this? Oh yeah, just hold the mic past. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that my experience here was really um, eye-opening in terms of being having a very diverse background in what I was studying, but also what I was doing outside of the classroom. So I was working with EA, um, external affairs here at UCLA, and like understanding how to fundraise money for a huge university and what it meant to talk with passion and share with story and then be able to talk numbers and understand how to, to really communicate that over. So I think those two mixes really helped me. And then I started uh, NRU where, um, while I was a senior here. And so one of my best memories is, is being in the library in between finals and having partner calls with Ghana and like in between finals and, and trying to pretend like it was our office. And then, you know, fixing the background and making sure that it looked a little bit more professional. So it was a really great environment to just be as optimistic and dreamy as I possibly could with knowing that UCLA was there to really support, so, yeah. Um, I, I went to UCLA Anderson and my right before graduation had a, an event here on campus that literally changed my life, I guess. It sounds dramatic to say, but um, pitched my business idea for fun at the Anderson Business Plan Competition and was shocked, happily, but shocked when we won and received venture capital funding on the spot. Um, so that was literally a moment that I will obviously never forget of, oh wow, okay, I guess I'm 
taking a different career path than I thought. And it literally kick-started your company. It li literally, that's the reason I started my company. Two weeks right. later, I was supposed to move back east, and I stayed here instead and started the company based on the work we had done at UCLA and the competition we won here. So, Fantastic. Ashley, what about you? So I'm a double Bruin. I went to undergrad here and just finished uh, at, at the Anderson School. And uh, I'd say that, um, in particular, the Anderson experience was really great as an entrepreneur because um, they had programs that I, I actually felt like I was using the MBA program to launch my business. I was building my projections when I was in accounting class. I was uh, asking my marketing professor how I even begin to think about how to position a company and determine a target audience. So. I kind of view my MBA experience as sort of like the launch pad for my business. So it was tremendously helpful. Yeah. That's great. And I, I go yeah, go ahead. Um, so I didn't actually have uh, my business when I was at UCLA or had any idea I was going to do that. Um, so I wasn't necessarily really involved in the entrepreneurship scene here, but I think something, um, as you said, being involved in extracurricular activities, I was on two dance teams here, um, so you get to go to a lot of dance competitions, they're not, you know, pitch competitions, but being on the stage, uh, having to meet a lot of people, kind of, I definitely think that helped build up my, um, my confidence as well as, you know, networking. I mean, it's not professional networking, but I do think that definitely helped. I took a public speaking class and it was very helpful, just in, in my career in general. Um, but um, okay, so you know, first off, I'd really love, well I guess this is second off now, um, but I'd really love for you guys to each share uh, briefly why you started your company and what you guys do. Definitely. So um, I've actually traveled quite a bit um, and lived in over half a dozen countries, either for a study abroad, internship abroad. Every summer um, throughout college, I went, I did a, an internship abroad, either in Colombia, Brazil, or New York, just in a different city. Um, and housing was so, so hard. Um, just finding housing for two or three months in an environment you're unfamiliar with, don't necessarily speak the language, uh, don't have any local contacts. And last year I was doing my master's in London and it just, um, it was so bad. Um, and so I think that was my, really my tipping point where I figured, you know, we should be encouraging students and young professionals to pursue international careers, to go out of their comfort zone, to discover the world. Um, but really when you have such a, logi a huge logistical obstacle like not knowing if you're gonna have a home or not, um, people may be discouraged. So when I did an internship, when I was going to do an internship in Brazil, like the, the day before, seriously, I didn't, have a, I didn't have a home. My dad was like, you're staying here, you're not going. I was like, do not cancel my plane ticket, I'm going. Uh, I'm just gonna st stay in a hostel and figure it out. Um, and so that's basically what initiated this, having the same problem over and over again, wherever I went. Um, and I figured, you know, I, I should do something about it because I do think it, we should encourage people, especially young adults in this age of globalization, to, to go out of their comfort zone and pursue international careers. And so uh, Easy Key um, is a peer-to-peer -peer home sharing platform where university students and young professionals who are on the move either for their studies or career can find rooms to rent that are available on a month-to-month -month basis in houses shared with other young professionals who share their interests and lifestyle. So it's basically everything you see around in Westwood, but if you're a student coming from France to UCLA and you don't want to do university dorms because you're either, you, know, you don't want to live with first year students or it's too expensive, you wouldn't necessarily have access to a UCLA student here who's going to study in Barcelona for the next semester and is looking to sublet their place. So it's basically a platform where you can connect, easily book a room, not get scammed like you would on Craigslist, and I think that's about it. Great. And what do you do? Um, so my company is called Enru. We're an online story-driven marketplace for products that are created in developing communities around the world. So it's really about empowering people through their purchases to not only discover the maker, discover where it was created, but really most importantly find out how their purchase directly invests in that individual and their community for generations to come. So um, the reason why I started it, I had been a very activistic teen growing up, and I was pretty frustrated with not having. What does that mean? Activistic teen. I don't yeah. Know. Well, I think 
for me, I just I had I grew up in this little town called Rancho Cucamonga. If you know where that is, it's like an hour east of here. Um, and I just always felt like I couldn't have a voice, and my actions weren't making big dents in the issues that I saw that were unacceptable. And I was in high school fundraising tons of money and being really involved and wanting to end things like global poverty. And I just felt like I couldn't do that. And so I, I really took that frustration. I started working at um, Invisible Children and Charity Water, these really millennial driven nonprofits and just found this love for activating a generation to do good in your everyday and seeing the potential that you could harness from really impactful decisions like shopping to tackle big issues like women empowerment and global poverty around the world. So when we started, and Root really came from a place of wanting to find another great tool for people who wanted to see change in the world and tackle big, big issues to do it in their everyday without having to feel like the only way you can make an impact is to buy a one-way ticket to Africa and leave your family, leave your home. Um, and so that's why we started it, but it's really come to more of this this community that we're building through the power of really amazing human stories is giving people a place to connect with other individuals that are trying to fight for dignified work. Which, you know, if you're in, for example, one of our uh, brands is in, in Laos, um, there's women there that have uh, been, you know, there's a lot of bombs that were dropped during the Vietnam era um, that just didn't have any opportunities. And so they've actually been melting the bomb material that's been deep mined, deep bombed from the area into beautiful jewelry. So when you purchase that, you're investing in that particular maker, but you're also able to help deep bomb the local fields to make it safer. So that's kind of why we started it and, and wanting to find both the consumer touch point of giving people a voice through what they wear, and then also on the creator side of giving opportunity through that meeting place, so. That's great, and Anne also came out of the UCLA incubator. Yeah, start of UCLA and Blackstone. We're still here, we're literally just downstairs, our office is there, <laughs> and we're moving in a month, so I'm sad. Awesome. Kelsey, why'd you start your company? Yeah, so my company is Vow to be Chic. Um, we're the first company that rents bridesmaids' dresses to women. So men have had the option of renting a tuxedo forever, um, and I've been a bridesmaid so many times, I said, this is ridiculous. Why am I spending hundreds of dollars on a dress that I never wear again? Um, so that was really my pain point. I was the, had the consumer pain point and figured out that something had to be done. So we started working with the top bridal designers, Monique Lulier, Jenny Yu, Nicole Miller, um, and we signed them on and we rent them. So that's a, I, I started because I was a customer and because I was shocked that in, let's see, in 2013, as I was about to gra graduate with my MBA, no one had done it yet. Men had been doing it forever and women didn't have that option, so. That's great. Ashley, tell us about Lunia. Lunia, so Lunia is a women's, like contemporary women's sleepwear brand. Um, it actually got started because one night I, uh, I walked past the full-length mirror in my bedroom and I took a look at myself. At, I don't know what I'd been thinking for years before, but I actually looked at myself before I went to bed and I was wearing my husband's old frat shirt with like a hole in it and his boxer shorts and I was thinking, oh, so this is what it looks like when you let yourself go, you know? <laughs> um, so then I was I'm like, sure like no one can imagine that. Like I'm sure everyone's thinking, I'm sure you looked fabulous. Ooh. Now you're breaking everybody. Sorry. I'm, I can be loud. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's where it started. And then I'm like, okay, I've got to be able to solve this. I'll, I'll go out there and I can't be alone with this problem. And so I, I tried to find something that would be comfortable and flattering. Because I'm not going to wear lingerie. And I'm not really ready for PJs, you know, the, the frumpy PJ set. So I'm like, there's got to be something for this person in between. There's got to be a lot of us like this. And the more I looked, the more I realized there really just wasn't a great solution out there. There was a couple people that were trying and they were like super frilly and girly, but that wasn't really me. And, and so I was thinking, there, you know, there's a genuine need here for someone that can, because really it's this time of day when, why wouldn't you want to look good? You would want to feel good at every time of the day and not have to trade being comfortable for it. So I realized there was a great need here and uh, I launched Lunia and, uh, and here I am, so. That's great. Um, okay, so you know, a lot of you figured out a time in your life to take this leap to be an entrepreneur. I never, like as an entrepreneur, I never saw another option, but I know, you know, like Kelsey, you had a more traditional route. When did you take the leap? How did you know 
when the right time was and how do you start? How do you start an e-commerce company? Like what's the first step? A lot of questions. Yeah, no, so I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to be. I graduated undergrad, went and worked in corporate America, had done some internships and startups. I wasn't sure. I knew that I wanted to be in retail or fashion. Uh, my parents pushed me into consulting just to you know pay the bills right out of undergrad. So I did kind of the more generalist, but I wasn't sure. I had done startups, I'd done big companies, and I was about to graduate UCLA and go to a corporate job, my corporate dream job in New York City. I'm from the East Coast, um, and that was the plan. I basically didn't think I was risk seeking enough um, to go for it and so the VC shocked me when they offered um, funding that evening and I, I had one of those moments it was 11 p.m. here 2 a.m. on the East Coast and I called my parents like mom and dad we won and they're like, so excited I'm like well wait now what do I do with my entire life do I stay here and start a company do I move to New York and they're like, call us tomorrow um, but it was really like a, I don't know how do I figure this out so I spent the summer um, working on it and saying like okay how do I make this I mean New York corporate job, job security, large paycheck, LA, startup, no paycheck, a lot of risk. And if, for me, it was just working on it and pondering it. And then I guess one day I got to the point where I said, OK, mom and dad, if I give up the corporate job and start this, and it fails in two months, which is a very realistic possibility, will you make sure I can pay my rent? And they said yes. And so I was like, OK, I guess that's my new risk threshold. If I, can, if I know I won't be homeless, I'm OK with it. So, but for me, I didn't know. And it was really, I knew I wanted to start one one day. I didn't think I would have the guts to do it right out of school. And what was the first thing you did to start the company? I mean, it's such a long process, as I'm sure everyone can attest. So the, we were offered the funding. That said, we had worked on it for the two years throughout the time at UCLA. So that was amazing for us to have it working on it throughout classes um, and really working on the business plan and doing the research. And so we thought through a lot of the things. So that was incredibly helpful to really leverage the time in school to be working on the business and thinking through all the different aspects. Um, but then once it, I was unsure for the summer of what to do, um, so I started working on it through the summer and to see how far I could push it and basically to see if I could get it to fail. Because that's what I decided. If I can get it to fail this summer, then I'll say, OK, I tried, and I'll go to my corporate job and my big paycheck. Um, but I just decided to push it as far as I can. There's, you, there's so many things to do with a startup, right? You feel like there's 100 things you have to do. You want to push them forward as fast as you can. You're trying to get a basic site up. You're trying to find good people to work with you. I think the biggest thing for me was one time I sat down with one of my investors, and I said, OK, so we could put like $100,000 into building out this great site and people will love shopping on it. And he was like, listen, I'm not giving you money to prove that you can build a great site. I'm giving you money to prove that women want to rent bridesmaids dresses, to prove your concept, to prove that there's demand. And that for me, that probably should have been super obvious, but I was like, you're right. Okay, anyone with enough money can build a great site, can build a, you know, whatever it may be, but you need to first prove that customers really want it. So really focusing on is there customer demand, doing a lot of research with customers, um, it was definitely the place, the place to start, but you're always doing a million things at once. What was the first thing you guys did, the rest of you? Just jump in. We're okay. girls. We love to gab. Um, I Googled how to make clothes because I had no background in fashion. My background was in online media. I had no idea where to start. I realized the problem, and I felt like problem's always a good place in my mind to start because um, it's not like I'm making something for my own. It's not like a hobby, you know, I'm, I'm making it because I felt like there was a genuine gap in the market, but I had no idea. So I started Googling, I, I started setting up meetings, and I also started talking to people about it more because sometimes through like articulating that like, the like, I have a dream to build this thing. People want to help you, and I've been I've been so impressed with how many people are just willing to. Hey, I know this person that that you know they're in that industry. Maybe they talk to you, and and it's sort of like leaping from person to person to person, and you get there, and it's amazing. And I'd say those things were kind of you know that would, that was helpful for me. So at least that was sort of the beginning stages of what my path looked like. And then the big turning points for me was building a team. So like. Being alone at a table is kind of a devastating feeling for a, when it goes on for a long period of time because it's like you're just pushing this ball up a hill by yourself and um, and people think oh being an entrepreneur means I'm gonna have this flexible schedule and this it's like it's like opposite it it means you're working all the time and anything to make anything happen you had to do it you know and so it's uh, it was very much that and then building a team is wonderful because you're like oh. 
things that are happening that I didn't have to do. And, and look, we're like force multiplied, and this is awesome. So I'd say those were, that was sort of a big turning point for me. That's great. Anais, what did you do? Did you rent a room? Did you, like? Um, I did end up finding a home in London. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Um, so I actually, I was doing my master's at UCL, University of College London. That's where I started um, the business. I saw everyone starting, all of my classmates were applying for consulting jobs, and, and I was just sitting there like, I can't, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I, if I have to do something, I can do it, but this was just like, there was a bigger force behind me, I was like, I cannot do this application, I have no desire whatsoever to do this, um, and I couldn't get this, you know, I was like, if I'm ever going to try to start my own business, it's now and never, and I have to say, like, it was probably for the wrong reasons. I'm gonna be my own boss. I can take vacation whenever I want. Like, that's not true at all. Every, you become a slave to your employees, your, your, your clients, your investors. So um, just like you think you're gonna have a lot of time, you really don't. And just like you think you're gonna be free, you're really not. But you, still, you should definitely still try. It's really gratifying. Um, <laughs> and um, so it, it really is though. Um, and so I really couldn't get myself to do it, and UCL has an entrepreneurship center, they have advisors, um, so I, and uh, we had a thesis to do for a master's, and I was able to, I talked to the, the director of my program, and was able to combine it with the master's in entrepreneurship, so I, my thesis was my business plan, um, so I think that's where I started um, to get the ball rolling, I really couldn't apply to all those, um, I guess, corporate jobs, and I had this idea that I couldn't get out of my head, so I tried to utilize my degree to, to, start, to get the business started. And I do not remember what the other thing was. Oh, the biggest piece of advice. Um, I think it definitely relates to what you said about, you know, you can raise money to try and build a great site. And what you should really do um, is not look for a developer, your MVP, your minimal viable product, which is what you use to prove, to go to investors and say, hey, look, I figured out this problem. I have lots of customers and I need your money to help me scale it and develop a cool site and whatever else and get a, gather a great team. Um, your MVP should really be for, so for instance, in my case with rooms, it should be going on Craigslist, looking, verifying apartments, visiting apartments, um, that people are trying to rent out and finding students who are needing a housing and by myself, as if I was doing this for myself, looking for a room, doing it for other people. Even if it's just for five people, that shows demand rather than having a site that costs you 60K and no one's on it. So I think the biggest misconception is finding a developer and needing the technology to show the demand and that is completely false, in my opinion. So um, that's great. You know. I would imagine one of the most important things about running an e-commerce company is the customers. How do you go above and beyond for the customers? What, you know, are the customers always right? Like, how have you guys gone above and beyond? Kelsey, I know you've done, you've gone, you do crazy things for your customers. And is that, all the, is that always the case? We have to because we're in weddings, right? So we can't, we've, we've talked, I think Anne actually, we were on a panel together and Anne was like, we emailed some customers and told them we were so sorry, but the product was coming late. We don't, we can't, right? We can't say like, well, sorry, your dress is gonna come a week after your wedding, you'll still look great. So that's not an option for us. Like you either make the wedding or you don't. Um, so we've had to kind of do, we've had um, maids of honor who've been traveling to the wedding location and they, um, one got frazzled and left her bag at TSA with her dress in it, another, the airlines lost it, and they call us the night before, it's typically the bride. Um, for some, one bride had my personal cell phone, like woke me up at six o'clock in the morning, freaking out the, night, the Friday before her Saturday wedding, and I ran into the office, and so it, it, with weddings, we will do whatever we can. We will literally like drop them off if you live in LA, we will ship them overnight, we've had like international things. Um, but the customer is always right, and as you were saying, Amazon is stealing all your money, we are, and I really need to come up, I need to stop saying this in public without a more eloquent way of saying it, but I believe that millennials are such spoiled consumers the, in the best possible way. I love it. Like, I could go on my phone right now and have, like, pick a service, right? I could have a massage here in 10 minutes. I could have food here. I could have clothes here. Like, we are so spoiled in the best possible way. So for us, and millennials are our customers, so for us it's about knowing your customer and what they expect from you and making sure we can deliver that. Like, they get our personal cell phone numbers of their bridal stylist. They have our email. They can chat us. They can call us. They can whatever it may be, is making sure we know our customer and what they expect because we are spoiled with two-day shipping and 
same day shipping now with Amazon in LA. I'm so excited. Um, but all of that stuff, we're so spoiled with it in the best possible way. So if we come in and we're like, well, we're going to ship it to you in two weeks, the customer has no interest in that. Do the rest of you agree with that strategy? I don't say that the customer's always right. Um, I would say that we try to be really transparent as a business. So one thing that's tricky for us I am a total Amazon user myself, but what's really tricky is for a small business, Amazon has really put me in a bad place because Amazon has set everybody's expectations that in two days for no shipping costs, uh, you can expect your product. Well, as a small business, that kind of kills me because that's re it's really expensive to do that. You know, when you have huge scale, no problem, right? But uh, that's a little tricky for me. So what we try to get in front of the problems as best as we can. So educating our consumers, like, hey, you know, we're, we tell them we're, we're a growing business, we're just getting started, like, um, you know, this is where your package is. We try to tell them what's happening. We send it out the day we get it, you know, this, but, but we have to tell them, oh, we'd love to offer you free shipping. We just, you know, we're a little early. Thanks for being one of our early, you know, supporters. And people I find are, like, if you give them the information and, you, and you're, you're honest and authentic about it, they, they're kind of on your side. So at least in our case, I, I mean, say, we always try to bend over backwards if we, if we do anything wrong and all that. But we also have to acknowledge that there's certain things that are beyond what we're capable of right now. And so I think that as long as we have a good dialogue with the consumer, it tends to help. So. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, it's a little bit different. So we have seen that the customer is really not buying product just to have product anymore. I think a lot of millennials are really searching for meaning and purpose and connection through what they're shopping for. And so for us, it's a little bit less on just the customer support side, but building this really deeper immersion of what it means to buy a product and do good with that product. So we've been testing out these push notifications where um, once you buy a product, you get to meet your maker and you get to see who made that actual product, but actually be able to get push notifications to your emails, you know, two weeks after to six months later about that maker and how her son got an A in fifth grade and how, you know, her, her, her town is able to employ so many more women and really uh, help them escape from sex trafficking. So it's a little bit more about this involved customer dialogue that you can build and it does help with some of those scaling issues because we're not able to sell a hundred thousands of these products where we can say we only have four more left but four more means we get to reach this amazing milestone so join us on that journey. So I think it's a little bit of messaging and connection and being able to deal with the, the customer side in a very innovative way that makes them feel like they're still special. And Anais, um, how early are you? You're, are you guys renting rooms already? Um, so we are. We're basically focusing on matching people. So okay. we are trying to do what Airbnb, so obviously you may have thought of how are you different from Airbnb, and I'll answer that um, for you guys. We're definitely adapting the concept of Airbnb, but also mixing it with the dating website matching concept. Because um, when you live on Airbnb, the average guest stays for four to six nights. So you, you want to love the home. You don't need to love the, get, uh, the host, I mean, the person whose house you're staying in. And most of the time, they're not even there. When you're living with people for one month or longer, you don't need to love them, but you need to stand them because you're going to be living with them. Um, so it's not just finding a home you like. It's really being able to find someone you can get along with and live with and potentially share a room with. Um, so what we're doing right now is trying as best as possible to match people ourselves. And, uh, <laughs> and for instance, uh, we'll try and go out of our way and schedule a Skype call with them and be present and seeing what, how we can basically enhance that connection, enhance the matching and so on. But I think in our case, it's a little bit more difficult in terms of is the customer always right? Because it's a two-sided marketplace, yeah. um, they both want very different things. The host wants to get the money ASAP. The guest who's renting the room wants to send the money once they know what the place is like. So they, it's kind of getting two opposite sides all the time. It's like, well, I see what they should pay a fee. I don't see why I should. And the, the opposite side says the exact opposite. Um, so I think it's one of the hardest things, I think, is getting customer feedback, but knowing what to listen for. Because everyone will want a thousand different things. Some some things will overlap, but some otherwise you'll go in all different kind of connection di directions. So I think that's one of the the hardest things to.
to know what to listen to. Because if you listen to everybody, I don't think you can get anywhere. I imagine your insurance policy must be crazy. Like you yes. probably need well, it. Right it's now, probably very different from like bridesmaids dresses, for example. Yes. So right now it's so crazy that we don't have one. Um, <laughs> 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 to simplify it. No, so for instance, what we're doing is to provide financial security, once you book a room, which is one of the biggest problems with sites like Craigslist, if you send your money directly to someone, you basically guaranteed you'll never see it again. So we hold your funds until after you move in. You have time, you have 24 hours to, to, um, to visit the apartments, get acquainted with your new housemates, and if, you, if both parties say, all right, this person is awesome, then we make the transfers. Uh, we're also going to implement a damage deposit policy, which is one of the biggest problems, uh, how I got scammed in New York. I lived with somebody for three months. When I moved in, I gave uh, a damage deposit. When I moved out, he gave me, and I trusted him after living, him for, uh, living with him for three months, he wrote me a check um, from an empty bank account. And he knew I was moving to Brazil next for another internship, and there was nothing I could do. Um, so once hosts usually get your money on a hold of your um, damage deposit, they don't really want to give it back. So that's also an, another insurance policy we're uh, implementing where we would hold that so that in case there's a problem, we, um, we look at the proof that each party provides and so on. But um, yeah, I mean, with rental housing, there's a lot of problems, just like if you think of Uber, what happens if you get kidnapped or if you get robbed or, um, and to be quite honest, we, you know, if we have millions, maybe we'll, I, I'm sure we'll try and do something about it or the easier thing could be to simply partner up with insurance companies, but we're too early to venture into that stage. I think if we look at that, it'll kill us before we even really get to take That's over the world. That's <laughs> fascinating. That's really interesting. Um, so, you know, I've actually met a lot of you guys at networking events, and this is essentially a networking event. What, you know, do you guys network a lot? What are some networking tips you have for when you're starting a business? And is it helpful, or do you guys think it's not important? Just jump in. Well, I mentioned when I first got started that I ended up talking to people all the time, telling them, hey, I want to start this, this company, and what do you think, and you know anyone, and this kind of a thing. So I think from that perspective, networking was amazing. But when I talk about that network, that's my friends and my family, the people that have a real vested interest in my success, and sometimes colleagues too. But I wasn't necessarily like going out to random networking events and meeting people and being like in a really sort of um, forced way, like, here's my card, and I'm going to be calling you and asking you for a favor. I would say, like, that, that wasn't, so sometimes I think the idea of networking is sort of interpreted different ways. My networking that was really useful was using my personal network, my friends and my family, and, and that got me really far down the road. Yeah, I'll take the opposite of that. So I wasn't from LA, and I mean, yeah. that's a great thing. If you have that, I didn't have that. I don't, like my family's not entrepreneurial. I wasn't planning on being an entrepreneur. I wasn't from this area. So I was like, okay, I'm staying here and starting this company, now what? Um, so I think that was a, I went to a lot of those entre networking events, and I think we all have that. We all have a, a busy lives with a lot going on. Of you're like, it's the end of the day, I'm so tired. I could go home and put on my comfy pajamas <laughs> and watch TV, or I can like go to this networking event. And as much as it like, may seem like the last thing you want to do sometimes, like I'm a big fan of just going because that's how I've actually met probably all of you guys up here who I know and met a ton of people in the space um, who have similar companies and we can sit down and talk about the challenges because as, as different as all of our businesses may be, there's also such similarities across every startup, right? So building the team, hiring, it doesn't matter what industry and you're going to be facing those same challenges. So. For me, those people have really become my friends in LA, my kind of extended network of kind of colleagues in a sense and confidants and people who are doing similar things of let's sit down and grab a drink and like de-stress or like vent to each other. I'm having this challenge. Have you dealt with that yet? What do you recommend? And so I've met and then also helping to build out your network of you know who, you know who you should meet this person and you know who's dealt with that before that person. Um, because as a first time entrepreneur, there's so many things that are obviously brand new that seasoned entrepreneurs have dealt with before, even if it's a completely different company. So learning from those people as well, and I've met a lot of them at networking events just because I didn't have a network here. <laughs>
Um, I think for me, it was really intimidating being a little bit on the younger side of entrepreneurs that I would go to an event and be like, who do I meet? You know, like, who's going to give me a time of day to just, like, listen to me for five minutes? So I think that that's a very common experience of not knowing what you're looking for when you walk into a room of really amazing people. But um, what I found was investing in the communities that you felt like were worth that time and not spreading yourself so thin and networking but really investing deeper into people like Kelsey and you know Jesse mentored me when I was like baby stage in the company and just really asking the right questions to the right people and then trying to give them as much value back as you possibly can in terms of utilizing their advice and and giving them a sense of of legacy to your story. So I think that was helpful. And then obviously being a part of Startup UCLA and working with Robert and Deanna and just really asking um, to be introduced to, to people that knew challenges better than you did. Um, and then we were lucky enough to be a part of the Forbes Under 30 Summit pitch in October. Um, and like Thursday before we had to be there, we found out we had to be there and we had to be there by Sunday. And then I had a, we had a pitch competition on Tuesday. And so we did this whole thing um, and ended up winning that competition and then being now part of the Forbes family. And so it's, it's crazy to now kind of shut your brain off in terms of that type of networking and really be targeted in terms of who you want to connect with, who you want to learn with, and then going full force at those people and making sure that you're very, not stalkerish, I know it's not the right word, but like, you know, you, you want to know what makes them tick. And yeah, you just, you want to learn who you want to, connect with and be able to really speak their language and ask them the right question. So it's changed over time. What about you, Anais? Yes. So I'd say um, if you don't have a big wow moment like, uh, the, like for you, um, I think networking is important, but I think you got to be careful because you might end up having endless coffees and lunch uh, meetings with lots of people, too many, I mean, you have to write the no people. I, I said that weird. You have to know the right people. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I do think you ha there's there's a thin line between you gotta you know after work you, yeah it's 8 p.m. but you still have to go network. You don't know who you're gonna meet, but you'll probably meet one really great person at that event. It's gonna be really helpful somewhere down the line, and you can give back as well. But I do think you have to be smart as well as to how you network and how how much you network. If you network too much, sometimes you have to stay at home and work until 2 a.m. and not go to that networking event. Um, and so I, I think that's uh, quite hard to manage, but it's something that you have to learn how to do. I, I'm, not, um, I'm not great at it, but I, do, I have learned that sometimes it's better not to go to a networking event and get the work done than networking and having coffee and having lunch and one coffee can turn into like a, a, a two hour talk that wasn't necessarily that helpful. Um, so I think th that's, yeah, I think that's the fine line that you have to be careful with. I think that's all really, really great advice. I can take, I mean, I definitely relate to lots of that. Um, I, I'm a little bit of a stalker. I've booked many guests by just stalking them online. I've booked Mark Cuban that way. I've booked Jessica Alba that way. And then, but then also, yeah, you can have endless coffees and you need to be strategic and with your time, especially when you're an entrepreneur. Well, with that networking, I think that's a great question to end on because the benefit of coming to an event like this is you guys get to network with this incredible panel. So. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A, and um, Melissa's walking around with a microphone, and I'm also notorious, if no one does ask questions, I'm notorious for calling on you and demanding that you ask a question. But I know there will be questions, so. Hi. Um, you mentioned a little bit about how EasyKey is different from the options that are out there. I was wondering if each of you or a few of you could talk about how uh, maybe a moment where you evolved your business model in response to competition, either existing or your perception of how competitors could uh, duplicate what you're doing right now. Um, so the funniest kind of horriblest tragedy trauma moment of our company was we launched and grew about three days before Tom's, you know, Tom's shoes. Tom's launched their marketplace, which almost had an identical um, mission statement as us, which was pulling products from developing communities and, and doing good through that. So 
that was really terrifying for us because we were like, we just spent six months trying to launch this company quietly and Tom's launched theirs. And so when we sat down and we said, obviously this validates our idea. They had been working with Deloitte. They had been working with all of these huge resources and they had barely come up with something that was just slightly more ahead of where we were and we had maybe $5,000 that we spent into building this company with like seven undergraduates at UCLA and zero idea what, what we were doing. So we're like, okay, it's like, it's like a good thing. That's terrifying. So I, told, I like called up my team. I think it was like 2 a.m. I called up everyone and I was like, guys, like, do not freak out. This is such a great time for us to learn from what Tom's is doing and then really jump off what they've been able to build because they put a lot of resources to get to where we were now so we're on the right track. And we sat down and we said, what really makes us different and what makes us unique is the ability for us to develop the story side of our products. How do we create this deep human connection through our product and be more focused on um, the, the content and the cause and the, the, the passion side than just an e-commerce product focused with a cool story? So um, in the, the months kind of that followed that, we did really prove that um, you know Tom's marketplace was great and it had such great um, products and story, but it wasn't catching people's attention even though they were on Ellen and Oprah and all these huge places. And so we really were able to take that and differentiate with our content and, and storytelling, which we're still building out, so. Um, yeah, so I, I would say, uh, I've got sort of two thoughts on that. One is um, sometimes when you're an e-commerce company in particular, you start to think like, okay, like I got to conquer the web, you know, I'm like competing with everyone and, and you start to like get kind of overwhelmed. You're like, okay, I need to own every single social media channel. I've got to be like doing something innovative in every place. And it, it actually becomes kind of like overwhelming and daunting. But um, I, I would say, so one thing that we have recently done is we're like, okay, let's, let's block out the world a little bit in, in two ways. Let's not focus on competition. Um, and I think that's sort of founded on the idea that the world is really big, and I think that if you can build something that people want, that there's plenty of people out there. And, um, and so I think that's sort of one thought. And then the other one is we're actually kind of moving back towards local, which is, um, I kind of feel like the whole world is taking their e-com platform and trying to reach, like, with a microphone to everybody. And I think we're kind of thinking, you know, what if we just, focused on the local area. Like, let's take Santa Monica and Pacific Palisades and how do we make sure that everybody has, that is our target customer has seen our brand, you know, twice in a month or something like that. You know, how do we think smaller to think big? And so 